Thank you so much, Jyota. Thank and you. now we're going to Samantha Estes from the University of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And she'll be telling us about investigating Dendrite self-avoidance using computational analysis of time-lapse 3D images. So Samantha, is it okay if I have a timer visible from my desk? Sure. Yep. Um, so, I'm, I'm Samantha Ingestevis. I'm a fourth year PhD student in Julie Lefebvre's lab at the University of Toronto. Um, and I'm going to talk today about one of my projects that's using computational methods of analysis, um, to uh, applying that to time-lapse images to try to understand how dendrites are able to develop their specific shapes. So, for context, because I think uh, people who do models sometimes forget, what I'm showing here is just one subtype of neuron that's been sparsely labeled. So it gives you an idea of how incredibly dense these neural tissues are. Um, and within these neural tissues, multiple different subtypes um, need to share this space and develop the specific morphology they need for their specific function. Um, so what I'm showing you here are six different neural subtypes, and you can appreciate how incredibly variable their morphologies are. Um, and what's really unknown in development is what are the cellular mechanisms that occur in order to result in these morphologies. And if you take the starburst, and these morphologies are known to be uh, really specific to, uh, implicated in the function of these neurons. So if you take the starburst amorphan cell, um, which is the model system that I'm working with, it's a, a relatively planar cell within the retina. Um, past work in our lab has shown that if, with genetic methods, if you perturb this morphology, it inhibits the ability of the cell for a specific function within the circuit, which is to direct, uh, to, um, to tune the direction selectivity within in, in motions, uh, motion detection, so inability to detect motion. Um, but despite this uh, mature cell having this beautifully radial morphology with minimal overlaps, uh, known as dendrite self-avoidance, um, early in development, uh, you can see this time course of development, approximately from postnatal day uh, one to six, you can see that this is not the case. In development, uh, their neurons are very comp uh, their dendrites are very complex, and they create uh, this really dense web uh, that has these self contacts. Apologies. Um, so this is just a P an example of a P3 starburst amorphan cell. So in their adult morphologies, they have these really radial morphologies. But in the, this context, you can see it's this really dense web. And the take-home message here is that this web is forming self-contacts. There are contacts occurring within these dendrites, uh, within these self-dendrites. So the question I'm really trying to understand is, how do you get from this morphology to the mature morphology? And what are these cellular mechanisms? So to try to understand this problem, I first went in vitro. So here you're looking at a cultured neuron. So this neuron is taken out of that environmental context, and it's really given its space to develop this morphology. So it's a single cell neuron. And what you notice are growth cones at the distal tip. So classical work knows that in, in axon guidance, these growth cones emerge. Um, in this example, it's dendritic growth cones. But moreover, there's these dendrite bridges. So outlined in green, um, you can see what I'm defining as a short orthogonal projection, which is a dendritic bridge. And this is the point of self-contact. And it forms this really uh, ladder-like or web-like structure. So this is in vitro. So then I looked in vivo to see, do these, uh, do these uh, morphologies come out in vivo? So again, this is in that very dense neural tissue. And you can see outlined in green and pink the uh, the uh, uh, growth cones at the distal tip, as well as the dendritic bridges. So this uh, allowed me to develop my model of uh, dendrite self-avoidance or dendrite development, uh, where you have growth cones that uh, have multiple bifurcations at acute angles, uh, in contrast to dendritic bridges that project at orthogonal angles. Um, and as well, the growth cones are at the distal tips, whereas the bridges are more proximal. But what static? But all of the static analysis is limit, limited. So what it can't tell you are the temporal dynamics. So how are these morphologies changing throughout development? And if you track these morphologies throughout development, uh, what is their, their uh, role in leading to that final morphology? Um, so to do to answer this question, I'm using time lapse imaging, so I can able so I can follow uh, these morphological events in real in real time, all in real time. And what I'm going to show you is one experiment, um, an example of one experiment. So this is a P4 starburst amorphine cell, um, and I'll just play it through. So. I hope you can appreciate here how much remodeling is occurring within the neuron. Um, and although there are points that are being 
uh, extensively remodeled, there are points that uh, are stabilized, that I hypothesize will become the primary uh, branches that are stabilized. So just to show you some um, frames within that uh, video, there was a growth cone at a distal tip, and the time course of these growth cones is approximately an hour. Um, and this is in contrast to the bridges, where they have much faster temporal dynamics. So in dark green are the invariant uh, branches that I hypothesize will be stabilized. Um, and in light green are the very transient and rapid, uh, rapid dynamics of these dendrite bridges. And this video will loop one time. So you can see, this is a 15-minute time step, and although the green branches uh, aren't extensively remodeled, the dendrite bridges are extensively remodeled. Um, so everything I've shown you up until here has been very qualitative. Oh, so this leads me to my hypothesis, uh, adding to my model of, of dendrite development, um, the time courses, and as well the role in development where growth cones are responsible for radial outgrowth, um, whereas the bridges are responsible for uh, dendritic spacing. So the question here is, how do you, everything I've been telling you has been qualitative uh, features, uh, and typically you scroll through stacks and, and a graduate student pulls out features and tries to quantify, quantify them at relatively low ends. Um, so how can you use uh, computational methods analysis to extract quantitative features from these time-lapse volumes? Um, so typically, if you're trying to extract morphological features, you start with a neuron trace. So what I'm showing you here is that same experiment, and then um, this neuron trace. And neuron traces are the most widely used open source file format for these neuron traces is the SWC file. Um, but one main caveat uh, in doing specific types of analysis is that SWC files are a ball and stick uh, a ball and stick uh, representation of your neuron tree, but the main assumption here is that each individual node within the tree cannot have more than one parent. So because of this assumption, you cannot directly encode closed loop structures. So how do you get around this problem? So the challenge here is you need to create faithful neuron traces, and when you have very complex cells that are early in development, that are near diffraction limited, um, how are you able to create and validate these neuron traces? Um, and then once you have these nodes of really complex uh, neurons, upwards of a thousand nodes, how are you able to link these nodes through time in order to follow their development, so going into that fourth dimension? And these morphologies are known to uh, contain closed loop structures. So if your file type can't even encode the morphology you're looking for, how can you answer your questions? So the solution that I'm proposing and I'm, I'm working on currently um, is an analysis pipeline that's using various open source and what will soon become an open source uh, program, the Dynamo program that's still in development, uh, to address these problems. So using VAW3D uh, to create automatic traces of every time point, and then 3D registration with Dynamo and uh, exporting the, the output of uh, importing the output of Dynamo into Python so you can extract your uh, geometrically defined features, so the acute angles or the orthogonal projections. So the pipeline starts with, this is a uh, created with ball 3 d this is a three-dimensional uh, visualization of one of my experiments. And you can take this, this is just one time point, and in input that into ball 3 d um, And this is a little... Uh, an example of, vault 3 d has many, many features, but one of the uh, drop downs it has is uh, all of these neuron tracing algorithms, and a lot of them are developed by third parties, it's not all of the vault 3 d team, um, but this trace that I'm going to show you, which was the output of the vault 3 d tracing, was, was created by vault 3 ds own algorithm here. Um, so you have a neuron trace, and it's an SWC file, it can't contain closed loop structures, um, and as well, all of these nodes are not linked through time. So this is my way of visualizing that you have all of these nodes which are supposed to be the same neuron elaps uh, developing through time. Um, so how do you link all of these nodes, that, uh, and with my neurons it, uh, specifically, there's about 800 to 1200 nodes, and all those nodes are connected uh, by segments. So with Dynamo, Dynamo is a program that came out, a MATLAB version, um, about 10 years ago, I think, but uh, new efforts have been going into converting their MATLAB version into a Python open source version. And I'm currently working with a student um, in Kurt Haas's lab at UBC uh, to get the, the specific feature of Dynamo, although it does tracing as well, um, uh, their auto registration, so the ability to follow these notes and track the, morpho the development of these morphologies through time. So then once um, I have my, my nodes linked through time, then I can export this. And what I'm showing you here is what um, all of these, a 2D projection of these nodes look like in uh, Python. And then in Python, I can uh, 
I have my geometrically defined features and then I can extract them and, and in that way analyze the whole arbor at once. So this is very much ongoing. It will be the next two years of my PhD. So what I've told you is that uh, static, uh, static analysis can't give you the whole picture. Time-lapse imaging can reveal dynamic features that are relevant in development. Um, and one of the things that it revealed is that these closed-loop structures are relevant, um, especially during development. Um, but the data structures that are open source and often used uh, don't have the ability to accurately occur, uh, encode uh, this, uh, uh, these morphologies, um, possibly obscuring interpretation and biasing, uh, obscuring these biological phenomena and biasing our interpretation. Um, so what I'm really looking for is an open source file format um, that's able to accurately represent these morphologies, these early in development morphologies, um, i.e. the closed loops. And my current uh, workaround, which isn't a direct solution, is to uh, build this pipeline, uh, starting with VAW 3D, uh, Dynamo for the auto registration, and then Python. And I just want to say that I'm giving a poster, so in this uh, brief talk about uh, my model of dendrite self-avoidance and development, um, our, work, um, our lab also works with a set of molecules, uh, exploring this really interesting idea of uh, neuron identity. Uh, so if you want to come check out my poster, I can give you sort of a, a broader uh, uh, depth of this, this model of self-avoidance, everything from the molecular up to uh, circuit, so two or three cell circuit level. Thank you. How automated is the process of neuron tracing? Like, if you wanted to trace a single neuron over development, yeah. about how much time would that take manually? Oh, manually. Or, I mean, sorry, no, I mean, like, with the pipeline, how much time yeah. would it would still be required manually? Uh, for, a, for an experiment with, like, 10 to 30 time points, so probably 10 seconds per time point. How much time uh, totally manually? Uh, manually? Yeah. Uh, like, three undergrads a week, probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, typically these neuron traces, like you have to get at your ground truth, so that's one of the things. How do you validate automatic traces? And typically it starts with a manual reconstruction, which tends to be a team of summer undergraduate students. Um, which file formats didn't work? Um, I imagine, I've, it's been a while since I looked at some of the 3D branching ones, but I'd imagine that even if they don't explicitly support closed loop, that you could just interpret two points in a branch having the same mm -hmm. coordinates as being closed. Yep. So that's uh, eventually, yeah, so that's definitely what I will do in Python. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, a, it's definitely a problem within encoding these structures. And, and for me, I'm specifically looking for closed loop structures because I, develop, I previously developed my hypothesis of branching. But if you're doing an automatic trace and you're not, you're looking at something else and, you know, it will automatically miss miss these, these contact points. So you mentioned that the cross uh, links uh, space the, the dendrites as they go out. So is there some relationship between the number of cross links and where they are between the dendrites? Because if they're producing some sort of tension, mm -hmm. you couldn't have sort of two on one side and one on the other, mm -hmm. otherwise everything would get messed up. That's, yeah, that's definitely my hypothesis. Um, that's something that I want to investigate in my analysis is uh, where do these bridges occur in, in, uh, on the dendrite as well as relative to other bridges. Uh, I, I, I see them proximally closer to the soma um, and less so at the distal edges, but that's, that's definitely something that I'm interested in, in figuring out. Thank you very much. Thank you.